let's talk about one of the coolest ways to use um, parametric equations, which is when we're talking about uh, simulating projectile motions. So this is talking about finding the place of an object in some sort of movement um, at a particular point in time. And so the, the, the problem that we have with um, using a rectangular um, form is that we can find the, the y value and the x value, the vertical and the horizontal position of an object, but it, it's basically going to be at, at a single point because um, we, we don't have the ability to add time in there. So by using the parametrization of, of, um, of, 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 pro, of, of projectiles, we can actually go ahead and, and map out a, 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 a clear path of, of projectiles. So I hope that kind of makes sense. But um, let's, let's start by discussing this formula right here. So this is a general projectile motion formula. And as you can see, I've, I've labeled um, the, the, the terms in this formula. And it is a, it is a quadratic equation. And this is uh, basically only the vertical one. So this is specifically for, for vertical motion. And so for this first one, uh, we have a problem that reads, um, there's, there's this guy on the ship. And he has launched a flare from the deck ship that is 75 feet above the water. So, um, and this flare has happened to go up with an initial vertical velocity of 76 uh, feet per second. And they want us to go ahead and graph the flare's path along this, um, along this vertical position um, with uh, terms of, of seconds, right? So, to do this, we're going to have to go ahead and use this formula right here. Um, and we're going to begin by uh, talking about this first one right here, gravity. So we're going to take half of gravity times t squared. And the force of gravity, um, if we're talking about feet, is going to be um, 32 feet. And if we're talking about meters, it's going to be 9.8. So since we're talking about feet here, we're going to be using 32. And um, since gravity is working in a negative direction, it's pushing down on us, we're going to go ahead and make this negative. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, y has to be equal to half of 32, half of negative 32, which is going to give us negative 16t squared. And that's pretty much going to stay the same for any um, projectile motion problems that you have that deals with gravity. So if we're on Earth, we're probably going to be dealing with negative 16t squared or um, or 4.9 meters when we're talking about meters. Now, the initial velocity is going to change. So depending on whatever the problem says, uh, we need to go ahead and plug in our initial velocity. And in this case, it's going to be 17 feet per second. So we're going to, sorry, 76 feet per second. So 76 feet Per second, which is my v naught, my initial velocity, and then we also have that t right there. And then we're going to go ahead and add in our um, initial height, which is going to be in this case 75 feet, so 75. And so here we have an equation that is going to model the initial, sorry, the the the, the, the vertical. Um, the vertical position of this flare, right? And I hope that you guys um, understand how we got each one of these terms. And this is a formula that you guys should become familiar with, especially for when you're um, going into your physics class, because you're going to be using it uh, to map projectiles. It doesn't really change. But again, this is just the vertical position. So since they didn't ask us about the horizontal position of the flare and they didn't give us any direction about whether the flare went left and right, we can honestly assume that this flare went straight up and then it went straight down into the ocean. So if we were to plug this in and we needed to have an x, we would just say that x is equivalent to t, just so that we have something. And if we go to Desmos, we can go ahead and map out the, 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 the flare's flight path, I guess you could say. So my x is just going to be equal to t. My y value is going to be negative 16 t squared. 
plus 76t plus 75. And as you can see, it just kind of goes straight up and then straight down. So it's kind of a weird thing to see. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and give this a couple of minutes. So um, let's say over about a minute. So this is 60 seconds because T is going to be representing seconds. And so you see that it's actually going to fall to the, uh, to the water surface after about five and a half seconds. So this is going to give you a very clear idea of what the height of the flare is going to be at any given point. So once again, you can see that, I wish this were a different color. There we go. We can see that it reaches a height of um, over 160 feet and um, it's launched from 75 feet and then it just goes straight up and straight down. The problem with this um, is that it doesn't really tell us anything about the uh, horizontal uh, movement of this projectile. So let's look at a question that actually does require us to use horizontal movement. Now, when representing velocity as a vector, we're going to use this right here. The V naught um, times the cosine of theta is going to give us the initial velocity for my horizontal movement, which is going to be my x, and the V naught times the sine of theta is going to give me my uh, vertical movement, which is going to be my y. So now let's think a little bit more about what's going on in this picture. So we're imagining that we're standing here and we're hitting a baseball. So here we hit a baseball that at exactly three feet off the ground. So the bat made contact with the ball at three feet off the ground and it flew away with an initial speed of 150 uh, feet per second. Now the angle at which it flew, so now we're dealing with an angle. The angle at which this ball flew is going to be 18 degrees with the horizontal. So now it's getting a little bit more complicated, but it's really nothing to worry about because we're going to have a place for each of these numbers, and as, as you guys will see in a moment. And uh, finally, we're going to ask a very important question. If we have a 20-foot high wall that is 400 feet away from where we hit our baseball, will it clear it? Will it go over? Or will it run into the wall? That's the question we have to answer. So we're going to begin by explaining why we can't do the same thing that we did before. When, you know, not taking into account wind resistance and everything, when we were talking about a flare going straight up and down, we were working with a 90 degree angle. So it's not that we weren't working with any angles, it's just that our angle was 90 degree. It was going straight up. And so for every one foot that it went up, every one foot was in the vertical di direction. I guess that makes sense. So the path, tra the, the, the path of the flare was, um, it traveled one foot, and that, one, that whole one foot was in the vertical direction. Now it's a little bit different. If something travels one foot or 100 feet, but now it's at a diagonal, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to get 100 feet straight up or 100 feet a straight horizontal. This angle is going to make it so that it's a little bit less than whatever actual distance traveled because this is going to be, you could think of it as the hypotenuse of a triangle. So now my initial velocity up is no longer going to be the 150 feet per second because remember we had the formula 
for y, y is equal to my um, negative 16 t squared, which is gravity, we already explained that part, plus we can't go ahead and put 150 t. We need to go ahead and factor in the angle. So it's going to be 150 feet per second squared times the sine of 18 degrees. And this is going to be my B naught. So 150 times the sine of 18. And remember that it's very important that we know that this is in degrees uh, times T. And then finally, plus the vertical height, which is going to be three feet. So plus three. Now for my X, it's actually a little bit simpler because since we're not taking into account wind resistance and the gravity does not work horizontally, uh, there is no need for this gravitational um, force in X. So it's just blank. There's nothing. Uh, since we are starting at zero in the horizontal direction and we're traveling 400 feet, um, there's no need for this three either. So the only thing to take account into account for x is 150 times the cosine of 18 degrees. And since this is going to be a value um, in terms of time, we're going to go ahead and take the 150 times the cosine of 18 degrees and multiply it times t, which is going to be our time in seconds. So now that we have both our function of y and our function of x, we can go ahead and plug this into the calculator. I'm going to use uh, this one right here. So I'm going to be using the ti inspired just so that we can get familiar with both of them. Let's go ahead and plug this in. So my value for x is going to be, in parentheses, 150 times the cosine of 18. And we're making sure that we're in degree mode right here. So that's going to be very important. Um, all of this times t, because we have time in seconds. And then for my y value, go down here, we have, all right, this is a big one, negative 16 times t raised to the second power and plus 150 times the sine, because this is, again, a vertical of 18 degrees times t plus the initial height of 3 feet. So we can go ahead and change this um, parameter interval to, let's say, 60 seconds. Let's see how far that goes. And we'll press Enter, and we can see that immediately this ball takes off. Uh, let's go ahead and zoom out, making sure that we didn't do any mistakes. We'll go ahead and zoom out. Okay, my question that I had before was where or, or will this be able to clear the 20 foot fall wall when it is uh, 400 feet, that is 400 feet away. So I guess a couple of things that we need to know is, well, where is it going to be when it is 400 feet away? So if we take this and we trace my graph at... 400 feet, I really don't think it's going to go ahead and clear that. Now, a cool thing about parametric equations is that this right here, this blue line, is the actual flight path of the ball. So we can actually go ahead and see exactly where the ball is at any given moment. And we can actually go ahead and graph the wall that we are wondering if it will run into or not. So for example, let's go ahead and graph this wall. So I'm going to go ahead and 
detail the value of the wall, which is going to be, it's going to be x is 400 feet away, and y is going to be uh, 20 feet high, because that's how tall my wall is, and since we need to give it a parameter in terms of t, we'll just say that it is in terms of t times, or t divided by 3, because t has to be reached in less than 3 seconds, because after 3 seconds, uh, you guys can see that the ball falls to the ground. Um, so we'll go ahead and press enter on this, and we see that the wall was actually created. So we'll zoom in, and we can see that this does in fact not clear my, my wall. I can actually go ahead and change the angle and let's see if it would clear it if, for example, it was hit at a degree of 19 degrees. And you can see that 19 degrees would also not clear the wall. It would actually run into it as well. But uh, once again, we can keep trying. Let's say the ball was hit at 20 degrees. And we can sort of experiment and see if he really wanted to make a home run. It would take, at the very least, uh, 20 degrees for them to be able to clear that wall. Um, so that's kind of just like a little fun experiment. Um, and I hope that you guys learned a little bit about parametric equations and how they're used. And hopefully you guys have a good understanding of them for when you go and uh, apply them in your physics classrooms. Uh, feel free to let me know if you guys have any questions. Uh, thanks for watching.